Uh, good afternoon, dear audience. I would like to welcome you all here on behalf of uh, Study IT in Estonia program. My name is Marili Hendriksson and I am program manager at the uh, in Information Technology Foundation for Education. Study IT in Estonia is a program initiated by Estonian governments, uh, government and so, um, in cooperation with the uh, Estonian ICT sector and um, uh, universities. Uh, our aim is to promote Estonian, Estonian ICT higher education. Uh, our um, brand name in, in English is Study IT in Estonia and in Estonian it is IT Academia. Our topic today is cybersecurity, uh, which is also one of the uh, flagship fields in Estonia in ICT higher education. So um, uh, today we have two curriculums uh, in the field, uh, one of which uh, is uh, taught jointly uh, by um, Tallinn University of Technology and the uh, University of Tartu, which is um, cybersecurity for master level students. And the second one is uh, taught by Estonian IT College. Uh, the name is uh, cybersecurity engineering, and which is meant for students at applied higher education level. Uh, in light of this uh, flagship field, uh, study uh, IT in Estonia has organized uh, this year already uh, three different events. One of which was uh, Cyber Olympics, uh, which was, uh, uh, took place uh, this year in February. Um, the aim of that event was to give to all Estonian ICT students a uh, possibility to participate uh, and uh, compare uh, your practical uh, and the theoretical skills in the field of uh, uh, ICT systems defense. Uh, that event was uh, organized jointly with the IT College, uh, Defense Ministry and the private company Vekviriti OU. The event was very successful. Uh, the building was full of uh, eager students and also um, auditorium. Um, in the end of the event, the Minister of Defence, Sven Mixer, uh, said the following words, and I would like to quote here. Uh, this has been a really important competition for the Minister of Defence. It's on a pair with the NATO cyber defence training events that are held here in Estonia. Uh, cyber coalition and lock shields. I'm really happy that the overall level of the competition and the competitors has been so high and I really hope that the event goes on to become an international competition uh, with the next few years. And um, I hope that uh, this uh, comes as a pleasant surprise to you. This is our goal for the next coming years. Um, if you would like to uh, receive the newest information about it, then uh, please uh, follow our Facebook websites and also our website, which is studyitin.ee. Um, the winner of the first Cyber Olympics uh, got the um, inspiring prize, but the participation at the uh, most impressive uh, information security conference in Europe, that was Black Hat Europe uh, in Amsterdam. And without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to the winner of first Cyber Olympics, Janos Kapp. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, like it was already said, I'm Janos Kapp, and today I will talk about a couple of security conferences, and uh, then after that I will talk about uh, cyber exercises and my approach to them. But uh, beforehand, a little bit uh, introduction about myself. I, ha I am a security expert in clarified security. My main job is uh, pen testing, code analysis, reverse engineering, research, and etc. Uh, so all of those are connected to security. Um, I have background in web and system development. I was a uh, web developer, after that I was a system developer. And in security field I have been like uh, about last four years, a little bit more, uh, like full time. I also found, have found uh, some vulnerabilities in different public uh, websites and uh, systems. But anyway, about this talk. Uh, this year I had the luck to participate uh, in Black Hat Europe uh, in DEFCON in USA. 
and I will talk about them both. Uh, I will compare them a little bit, uh, uh, what is the differences, uh, which I maybe like a little bit more or less. Uh, and also after that I will talk thoroughly how I approached and how I approached this year to Cyber Olympics and how, uh, how I can use my own knowledge in attacking systems in defending them in such situations. Uh, but starting from Black Hat Europe, uh, it was held in Amsterdam. It was actually four days total, but uh, all the Black Hats in Europe, Asia and USA, it is divided. It's not like entire one uh, conference, it is divided. For example, in Amsterdam, it was two days of trainings and two days of uh, lectures or briefings or talks. Uh, and training part uh, was uh, done by different companies. Uh, you could choose some training and participate on that and then you will pay extra for that. Uh, usually the cost is somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 dollars or euros in uh, uh, Europe. Uh, briefing part, this is what I participated. I didn't go to any trainings in Europe on one. And um, this part is usually between 1,100 and 1.5k. Uh, it is without that, so it's not that cheap for briefings. I got a little bit cheaper because I'm a student, <laughs> but uh, there, there is possibility to get a little bit cheaper uh, by being a student. Uh, the briefings part is held in different uh, uh, tracks. So there's usually, in this case, there was four concurrent uh, briefings or talks given at the same time. So we have to make some kind of choices between the different topics. Uh, the topic selection was really wide, starting from uh, uh, like uh, hardware level stuff uh, to going up to uh, uh, memory, memory corruption issues and this kind of stuff. Uh, the wide level of content, uh, some were really technical, some were more like uh, overall or uh, um, political or this kind of approaches. And uh, what difference Black Hat from Defcon, for example, there's a lot more marketing stuff. So there's a lot of companies advertising their uh, products there. This is not connected directly to briefings. Briefings are separately, but if you can want, you can go talk with different vendors. They have quite knowledgeable uh, representers there and you can make yourself accustomed to their tools. So, but since I was there for briefings mainly, uh, so this was my first day. Um, I will go through all the topics a little bit, uh, one by one, describing, and after uh, going all, uh, through all the topics, I will concentrate on one topic that I think it's interesting for you to hear. Uh, the first topic was uh, cybersecurity in oil and gas industries. Um, I picked this one because I thought that uh, they will talk about new types of attacks that you can do against uh, uh, software that is used in this kind of uh, systems and uh, hardware and uh, tools, but actually it was mainly about describing how the cyber, uh, how the oil and gas industry works, how how these things are moved, uh, that uh, there's diff different software on one part and um, uh, moving is different uh, software and all this kind of. Uh, they pretty much only describe what are the possible places of attacks, which kind of uh, actions you get, can attack. And then they described a couple of uh, vulnerabilities also, but vulnerabilities were really common, like common injections in um, web application parts of this uh, software. Uh, since there's not a lot of people, you can download this software. It's really likely that they have these kind of vulnerabilities because there are not that many people who tested them. Uh, second one. The second topic was really technical. Uh, it was attacking the OS X uh, kernel. Uh, and this was interesting uh, how this person managed to get uh, uh, previous escalation vulnerabilities running. Uh, if you get the possibility that the slides that he used uh, are up, actually all the presentation slides are up. Uh, also uh, in future, some or all of the videos might come up. For example, Black Hat USA uh, Black Hat USA videos are mostly up already in YouTube, so you can look from there. Uh, but this yeah, was previous uh, escalation uh, vulnerabilities and exploitation in XNU kernel. Uh, the third one, uh, this was also really technical. Uh, this was by South Korean, I think, I'm quite sure about uh, from South Korean hacking team that uh, managed to get, I think it was 60 or $70,000 in last Bone Down competition for uh, successfully exploiting Windows Explorer 11, 
with 64 bits and all protection mechanisms activated. And they described how they uh, got the code execution running in heap overflows. And after that, how they uh, break out from the sandbox, so process escalation, breaking out of the sandbox of the uh, Internet Explorer. So really technical talk. If you get the uh, possibility to listen it, uh, then uh, for certainly have yourself other slides at the side because uh, that English that they speak, spoken was not that easily understandable, but the slides and information inside it was really worth it. So uh, if you're interested in memory corruption issues and this kind of really technical stuff, then I recommend you to download the slides and take a look of them. And if the video comes up somewhere, take a look of that. Uh, and then the last one was uh, the topic that I hoped I can uh, describe a little bit uh, more thoroughly here uh, because it was about defending, but um, actually it was not that good uh, in the sense that it was good, but not for such exercises as uh, Cyber Olympics because it fo mo mainly focused on uh, protecting against a denial of service at types of attacks. So yeah, denial of service was in uh, Cyber Olympic. Uh, but it was really a small part of it. And pretty much the entire talk was how you conf can configure different things. They focused really largely on IP tables and the stuff that they showed were cool, but uh, it was usable in future only against DDoS attacks or making yourself more accustomed in IP tables. Second day. Uh, the first topic was insecurity of backend of service. Uh, this I will not describe uh, more thoroughly currently because this is the topic that I will describe uh, later on uh, and really detailed. Uh, then the second topic was the topic that I have most use in my own research. It was about how the team that presented it uh, was fuzzing Android core elements and finding uh, or refining old vulnerabilities there. Uh, how they detected the crashes, how did they implement the fuzzing and fuzzing is method to uh, find security vulnerabilities those who don't know. But yeah, how do you do it in an Android environment? Uh, they were from Intel. So they, uh, at top moments, I think they were fuzzing uh, in 40 or 50 different mobile phones concurrently. Like all of them were fuzzing and trying to find vulnerabilities like automatically. So this was really interesting. If you're interested in fuzzing and mobile application uh, security, especially in uh, like uh, uh, lower level, not uh, Java based, but uh, in lower level, then this is interesting talk. Uh, and uh, the materials slides were also quite helpful if you want to find out which kind of tools they used. Uh, third one, uh, that I was a uh, little bit late because I was talking with uh, some people there. And uh, actually the topic was pretty much about breaking out of the sandbox. It's not exactly sandbox, but pretty much the idea of breaking out, uh, out of Linux uh, Docker container, uh, which is pretty much a sandbox. And last tool, uh, last talk, sorry, was about discovering uh, uh, flash player zero days attacks. This is not vulnerabilities, discovering vulnerabilities, it's discovering attacks. Uh, and uh, the guy who gave it uh, uh, started thinking last year that next year, or by now this year, which is probably the biggest target this year. And he figured out that maybe Flash. So he wrote tool to automatically download Flash files from all kinds of places and just check them out automatically. Are they containing exploits or uh, actual attacks? Uh, he also described how he did it. Uh, there was some function hooking and this kind of stuff. But pretty much if you want to see uh, like exactly how he did it, there are slides available. But this is what uh, the talk was about. Now, uh, going to the one that I will describe more thoroughly. Uh, security as a, insecurity in, of backend as a service. Uh, for those who don't know, a backend as a service is for a situation where people want to write, for example, mobile apps, but don't want to write the backend, the database, uh, the server, and all such. So Amazon provides different tools for that. Uh, pretty much what they uh, provide really easily is tool that you can use to connect to uh, their cloud uh, database and directly ask stuff from there. So they provide also really, really simple APIs uh, for multiple languages to connect. And they are really easy to set up really much you login, uh, create user, you get the password and stuff that to connect to and it's cheap and really easy to set up. So 
uh, there's quite a lot of mobile app developers who use this kind of pro approach. Uh, what was the main problem or what is the main problem? And this is not only Amazon. There are other uh, backend as a service uh, providers also, but uh, Amazon is probably the largest one. This is a snippet of code from Amazon database connection tutorial. This is code that runs inside mobile app. Now, those who are not accustomed to programming might not exactly understand, but those who are, you pretty much just make connection to uh, S3, uh, S3 uh, well, let's say, database or backend. And you provide two authentication things, access key and secret key, which they're pretty much is, is a username and password that are provided by Amazon when you create the new, uh, new uh, user there. And based on that, it connects to the database. Many of you probably already understand that this, this is going really badly if you just use these kind of methods because those username and password have to be inside your mobile app. And if you have no backend, you are going to directly connect to database, that can't end well. Uh, yeah, but security. And it's amazingly common practice that someone who writes a mobile app to do whatever he wants with that, uh, creates account in Amazon or some, some uh, this kind of uh, service. Uh, uh, the service provider gives him username and password. He just takes those, uh, makes connection to the database using those username and password that are given automatically to new users, and then use database as a you would you would use any other database. The re result of this is the fact that your application contains database username and password. In, in, and in case of Amazon, it's not only uh, username and password for uh, database, but also for virtual machines, backups, pretty much uh, the default uh, password and username that uh, uh, Amazon gives you is root access to everything that you own. You can create new users, but when you don't think about this, you will not, and a lot of the people haven't thought about this. And uh, someone would say that, well, yeah, you have password and uh, username inside the application, how to use it, but of course, reverse engineering the mobile apps that are written in Java is trivial. Uh, there has been some who hide it a little bit, but it, it's just a uh, little bit uh, more time. It takes a little bit more time. And um, what they did was, after they discovered that some people actually use those services as such, they created uh, pretty much, they automated reverse engineering and uh, downloading of a huge number of uh, APK uh, files, downloaded those, unpacked, uh, looked up what is the username and password, and then went to uh, Amazon or some other databases and looked what does this, what does, uh, this database contain. So how common it was, uh, they pretty much get out 56 million of uh, information, uh, like uh, rows of information, it included personal data, pictures, process data, credit card numbers, all this kind of cool stuff that probably you shouldn't have access to. Um, they informed, they informed Amazon and the other, I don't remember the name of the other uh, service provider that they also tested on this regard, uh, but it was owned by uh, Facebook. So they informed Facebook and Facebook in turn informed the company. And uh, well, there was reasonable uh, uh, disclosure, so they didn't, publicize it uh, for quite some time and gave like six months to fix everything. Uh, by the end of six months and a couple of days before the black hat, they rechecked and less than 1% was fixed, but some additional ones have come up also. So pretty much if you go now, reverse some APKs, you might find a lot of data. You shouldn't do it, but it's possible. It's public information, it's also uh, available from uh, those slides, how they did it. So this is problem. So, oh, and also if someone from here writes mobile apps, don't do it like this. Um, but yeah, Black Hat overall, uh, quite many good talks. I was really happy with uh, quite many of them. Uh, at least two of those were really useful for my own research. But there wasn't much activities or uh, stuff to do outside of talks and talking. Yeah, you can, can go to vendors and uh, make them or ask them to sell you something. But uh, that, that wasn't, uh, well, you have to have quite a lot of money for that. 
and a uh, little bit for my point of view, a little bit too high price tag for only talks. For two days of talks, uh, up to 1.5k euros, it's quite a large, large amount of money. So, as compared to, to, to DEFCON, this is quite good comparison between DEFCON and Black Hat. The Black Hat, formal, DEFCON, well, not that formal. Uh, it's, it's not that Black Hat is really formal, it's simply more formal. And a little bit about DEFCON numbers. Uh, it costs $230. It's four days. It's also multiple tracks, so multiple concurrent uh, talks going on constantly. Wide selection of topics uh, and also really wide selection of level of those topics. Like some are really technical, some are not. And lots of act additional activities. And this, about those I will talk a little bit later. So, in DEF CON, uh, different from Black Hat, I didn't participate on a lot of talks. Um, I participated on one workshop, which is pretty much training, and I participated on a lot of villages and uh, villages, not competitions. And there was a lot of uh, people there. Uh, I think it was like 30,000 people. 13, not 30. So, yeah, about those workshops, uh, they're pretty much trainings. Uh, one day or much, much shorter. Uh, they are given by just people who like to give them. Uh, they get some money also, but really like uh, small amounts. And they are free. If you get already into DEF CON for the $230, you can freely uh, participate on those. But you have to be quick to register because uh, the register opens before the DEF CON and if you uh, um, uh, you are too late, then you can go there, and if somebody doesn't so show up, you can still participate. But yeah, uh, and the topics are really variant. Like uh, like you can see, I uh, exploited host analysis, ARM for pen testers, real technical stuff, embedded system design, which is like hardware level stuff. So really wide selection, but mostly mostly technical. And villages. Villages are like totally different kind of stuff. Uh, they're hands-on events or uh, talks or constantly going on activities, and there are really dif different topics. And you, in most cases, you can go and actually try them out. For example, there was biohacking. One guy showed, and you actually can order it also in Estonia. They will send you RFID chip that you can uh, put with a needle inside your hand. And this guy had like 10 of those. And he showed like, this is for opening my front door. This is for my workplace. And yeah, you go, you put against the RFID reader, and door opens. Like uh, you usually have some kind of card or something like this. No, it's injected actually inside of you. Uh, there was car hacking and connected to car hacking, I really recommend everyone to look. Uh, uh, this uh, DEF CON talk is public uh, in YouTube available. It's about how Charlie Miller and I don't remember the other guy's name, how they managed to find a way uh, to exploit uh, some of the cars internal systems so at some point they were able, I don't remember how many cars there was, but they could, over the internet, they could activate the brakes, for example, or turn the, uh, turn the uh, wheel. So quite cool stuff, but uh, like, uh, look at uh, both in the aspect of how cool it is anyway, but also in aspect that how much effort it went to, into it. There are really good people at doing this kind of stuff, uh, really top-notch, and it took months and months and months for them to re reverse engineer stuff, to get the exploit runnings and all this kind of testing and stuff. Then there are damper evident, where you learn how to, you know, the, for example, if, uh, if you send something that is marked and uh, you can't open it without breaking the seal, well, in this uh, village they taught you how to open them so nobody will uh, understand and close them up so no proof will remain that they were open. Like uh, temper evidence like police uses for not tampering the evidence or such. And there was packet hacking uh, which is network stuff and lock picking. Lock picking village was really popular. There was a lot of people lock picking there. There was like free locks available. Uh, I think some free lock picks also but you can buy in Defcon you can buy insane of uh, insane uh, comp uh, insane of uh, amount of different lockpicks they actually like three or four uh, companies sell lockpicks during the defcon so you can buy your own 
And there was uh, competitions, uh, like uh, the most famous Capture the Flag. Uh, there was also Crash and Compile, which I think is really cool because it combined beer and uh, programming. Uh, there was Hacker Jeopardy, and there was like all kind of uh, competition stuff you can think of. So, a little bit about the world. Uh, Defcon Pros, more docs overall, much more activities. Uh, and more industry people, but there was a lot of non-industry people because since the villages were really rare topics and the price tag was uh, small, and then there was a lot of different, uh, uh, different fields uh, of people there. And uh, Black Hat Pros, it is a little bit cheaper and closer if you, it's in Europe, and there are more high-level company events, like uh, if you need to create connections with some vendors and stuff, this is quite a good place. Uh, but if you go like uh, just want to, uh, to uh, listen to talks, then it's probably not as good as Defcon. But they're both really good. But about the prices, if you ever have a situation that you can go only to one, uh, either your company has some kind of limit. Uh, I made a little bit of math. I was interested that uh, one is in Amsterdam that you pretty much fly one and a half or two hours and you're there. And the other is uh, Las Vegas, which is bloody far. So travel, well, DEFCON pay, uh, costs a lot, lot more. Participating, Black Hat costs a lot, lot more. And accommodations, uh, it depends. If you, uh, in both places, you can pay insane amount of money for, uh, for accommodation. But uh, if you choose like reasonably, then they are pretty much the same. Actually, DEFCON is even a little bit cheaper, but uh, in Las Vegas it's cheaper. But since you have to be there longer, it pretty much evens it out. So the difference about the prices is uh, less than 10%. So my recommendation is actually both are really good. I really enjoy the uh, Black Hat talks and I really enjoy the overall stuff in uh, DEF CON. They're both really good. If possible, participate in both. You can get really interesting connections in European Black Hat, for example, that you can't get in the USA because not everybody went there. But uh, yeah, if only one is possible, I would choose DEF CON. But this is my personal opinion, and this is, uh, this is my uh, thinking. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about is uh, about cyber exercises. Uh, how many of here, out of curiosity, want to participate next year in uh, uh, Lock Shields? Is there? Okay, some. Most in. Uh, <laughs> I have about cyber exercises overall. Uh, I have. Quite many years participated in locked shields, uh, not in defending side, but attacking side. So I know pretty much how, how Red Team t does its things. I have participated on some less known exercises, both inside the Blue Team or inside the Red Team. And I think in total I have someone around 10 uh, different cyber exercises uh, done. And <clears throat> my approach to them has been based on the fact that I'm reasonably good at, uh, I have reasonably good idea what the attacker side does. Of course, I don't know exactly attacks or something like that, but I have been in the attacking side enough times that I can base my defense on the attacks that I would do. And I think this is quite uh, successful, and we have seen the teams that use this kind of approach to be more suc successful. Uh, so basic points that I will ask myself is uh, as an attacker, which kind of actions from the blue side or defending side I would hate? Uh, what would stop most of my attacks or at least large amount of them? How I would discover my own attacks from the logs? What would be the signatures to look for? What tools would help me doing that? And how much, and this is quite important, how much I can automate the setup and the uh, activities that I have to do during the exercise. Because automation is important since you don't have time to follow everything yourself. Um, so why it's important to know the, how the attacks work or how the attacks uh, uh, are done. Uh, it's hard to protect against unknown. If you don't know how the attacks overall are made, then you're relying only on, yeah, I have to do, use to this tool to protect. Against what? I don't know. Attacks. Yeah, but against which they won't that, uh, protect? I don't know. 
So you pretty much have to know how the attacks are made. And for example, in CloudFront Security, there's both uh, uh, system admin and uh, web developers trainings, security trainings, and they are both uh, talked in the attacking side point of view, how the attacks are made. Because if you don't know the attacks, it's kind of hard to protect yourself against something that you don't know. Uh, also, it's hard to select uh, and use tools without understanding how they work, even defending uh, defense tools. Yeah, big companies sometimes buy like half a million dollars a box into a corner and say it, it will protect us against what? Everything. And how it works? Well, it works. Why? Well, the vendor told us that it works. And actually, it's quite common approach, uh, almost depressingly common, because uh, uh, you don't invest, uh, some companies don't invest to uh, technical people, only tools, but if you have only tools and nobody knows how to exactly use them, they are quite useless. Uh, and also it's kind of hard to find uh, attacks from the logs later or during the exercise uh, if you don't know what you're looking for. So my recommendation is uh, before preparing for this kind of exercise, learn the attack methods, learn how the attacks work, Try out some of those. There are a lot of tools and already like vulnerable websites or places where you can test them out or virtual machines that you can set up and attack and try out. And learn how the defending and a lot of other tools work inside. Like how learn the internals of stuff. So you're not just running some attack or defending scripts or programs, but you actually understand how they work. Then there's also uh, aspect that makes exercises a little bit different from the real life. In real life, you might use similar tools, you might use similar, similar approaches, but in real life, the main point is not to get highest score, to go to Black Hat. Uh, in real life, the objectives are often a li little bit different. Uh, but in exercises, you have to know and understand how the scoring works. It is not always told. You are maybe told only that, uh, well, you get minus points if you're owned and you get plus points if you, your services are up and working as they should. But as much as possible, make, un, uh, try to understand how the scoring works. Then really important aspect of all these exercises uh, are how the attacks are made. Are they made manually or aut uh, automatically? I have been in both types of uh, uh, exercises and there are Quite, quite big differences in protecting against this kind of stuff. For example, if you have human hand behind the attacks, they are manually doing some of the attacks, they might have also scripts to automatically do, but if those scripts fail, they will go in uh, automatically, well, sorry, manually. And if you just put up some kind of uh, signature recognition or something like that, that blocks this exact attack, uh, that was done ma uh, automatically, then good attacker will find way past it or find different way to do exactly the same attack but with what will go through your protection mechanisms. If the attacks are automated, that is much less likely because it automatically does only the similar attacks or it has at least a limited pool of different types of attacks. Of course, it's also really important to know how much, uh, as much as possible from the environment how the network is set up, uh, what uh, operating systems are used, what uh, services, what software, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, for example, in uh, Cyber Olympics, the network schema was pretty much known. Uh, the operating systems were known, and there was uh, recommendation what to learn. There was like, uh, you might learn mod security to prepare yourself. Okay, probably they use Apache. Since they use Apache and Ubuntu, well, PHP is likely. And you can think on like what they might use and prepare yourself, prepare your scripts. So first steps during the exercises, uh, implementing as much fixes or configuration changes as possible. And by fixes, I don't al always mean like I start fixing your web application because you will not fix everything. Uh, those people that prepare these kind of exercises, they make sure that there's enough vulnerabilities that they will successfully at some point attack you. You might fix a lot of them, but if you only fix stuff, then they still might own you in a little bit different ways of attacks or the one attack that uh, you were not protecting, protecting against and they might uh, wreak havoc by doing this. 
So much more important is uh, to do some configuration changes uh, that mitigate the attacks. You expect to be owned at some point, at some level, but you meet it, uh, two configuration changes that if they get in some way, they're as, as encapsulated as possible. I will describe later a couple of examples. Then you have to know how do you monitor the attacks? How do you monitor what's going on? Because some attacks will go through and you want to know how they went through and what they exactly did. Uh, and you usually want to set up some kind of method to block attacks that you have discovered and always not fixing because, you know, for example, that what I used was I set up a, a snort and I, uh, during the exercises, I wrote new rules based off the attacks. I didn't fix the application itself. I fixed it only then when I had time. But what I did was wrote new rules to block out bad traffic or vulnerabilities that I discovered by this method. So <laughs> this is what I did. Uh, this was, uh, I might be mistaken on the order on some aspects and maybe I did something more because it was still half a year ago. But first step that I did, I made almost any, everything unwritable by VV data. VV data is user uh, that ran, uh, that Apache ran as. I think it was running as VV data, not root. But always in this kind of exercises, look how the Apache runs. If it runs as root, you probably want to change it. Uh, then I did a PHP hardening. Uh, this is like configuration that you can do in PHP in a file that you disallow pretty much everything that seems bad, like system commands, uh, including files outside of the uh, web server, uh, going uh, outside of uh, um, HDocs uh, main directory, and etc. Et oh, I can't pronounce it. So if you look up, you Google PHP hardening, uh, I think the first page or second is a really good blog post about this and how, what you should do. And this has helped me not only in this exercise, but in a lot, lot others. So look up PHP hardening because PHP is widely used in this kind of exercises because it's kind of really easy to add terrible, terrible vulnerabilities in PHP applications. Like uh, code execution, uh, you can upload PHP file and just run it and stuff that is a little bit more difficult in Java or some other application. But all the, those vulnerabilities are still possible, but PHP is used widely because there's a lot of people who can write it, a lot of people who can understand it, so it's uh, more honest for participants. Then I opened the uh, 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 terminal window that uh, pretty much tailed the uh, Apache access log. And after, uh, before that I configured Apache access log to also log post parameters. Uh, so yeah, I constantly dealt the uh, Apache access log just to see if new types of uh, requests came in. I looked at them, analyzed, okay, they tried to do this kind of attack. I know now there's this kind of vulnerability. No matter how did they succeed it or not, I knew what to look for. Uh, then of course I enabled and configured uh, a firewall. I think that I configured in a way that you can access only web server and SSH, and SSH you can access only from your own IP. So there's no one else connecting to it. Then I set up Snort uh, with the most strict rules that I could find anywhere publicly, and configured that uh, as an uh, as it means intrusion prevention, uh, not intrusion detection. Intrusion detection, it just detects, oh, you got owned but IPS like actually blocks stuff that he uh, regards as uh, dangerous. Oh, and then there was some kind of functionality I remember that had uh, some kind of application that had upload functionality. And since, since I didn't want to break the functionality of the application, I uh, made this upload directory writable again by VV data and made it not directly accessible from outside. So you, can't, you can upload your PHP file but you can't execute it because you can't have access. So uh, by doing those, what type of attacks I uh, blocked or reduced the effect of those? Uh, first of all, cross-site scripting, sorry. Uh, this is where uh, manual versus automatic comes out. Snort blocked some of the cross-site scripting attacks. If you attack manually, you will find way past it, almost certainly. But if you use automated attacks, then it's good probably that Snort blocks at least most of them. SQL injection, exactly the same issue. Uh, I 
I think for SQL injection in database, I also removed that uh, user that used to for connection. It doesn't have uh, like uh, possibility to remove tables and stuff, but pretty much most of the tags were blocked by Snort. And again, same. You can write SQL injection attacks really different ways. Uh, but if you do it like beforehand uh, uh, written scripts, then I can see what kind of methods you use and I can block them or snort well. And this was really important, like constantly writing new snort rules for the attacks that I saw and that were uh, successful in some cases. So OS command injection, PHP hardening takes care of it pretty much uh, all the time. Uh, PHP traversal, uh, again snort for some and PHP hardening reduced the possibility that you can access really important stuff with uh, path reversals. Um, PHP code injection and backdoors. Again, PHP hardening was uh, the main part that uh, removed everything really bad stuff you can do. For example, it didn't allow eval. It allowed a function like system or execute. Uh, exec uh, so you couldn't run system commands from PHP, which reduced the impact of this kind of backdoors heavily. Well, DDoS, that I failed heavily. My everything hanged and nothing worked. But luckily for me, uh, everybody else was in the same boat. So, yeah, <laughs> I failed on that. Uh, I haven't actually thought m that much about uh, what should I have done at that point uh, with my uh, that moment of knowledge. I ex actually expected DDoS to not happen. I thought that uh, people doing the exercise might regard this as a little bit dangerous for a core network and might not risk crashing everything. But uh, the core network was good and it didn't crash, but my applications crashed. Uh, so yeah, I failed on DDoS heavily. Uh, and again, PHP file over, uh, overwrite and upload. Uh, since uh, may, uh, almost everything was not writable by VVA data, only the upload directory uh, and upload directory was not accessible. So PHP file upload worked, but they couldn't execute them. And this was actually uh, interesting because uh, scoring uh, hadn't uh, figured that this kind of possibility might exist. So uh, I still got the minus points I have and uh, needed to go and say that, yeah. Yeah, but this wasn't uh, described. Uh, this wasn't inside application. If in the application you would need uh, access files, then of course this has to be done a little bit differently. But in that case, it was only uploading, not directly looking. There was no functionality to look files. So, so for this situation, it worked. But you have to understand how the functionality works. This is a good point, and you have to understand how the functionality works, and you can't break the functionality of the website or services or and stuff because if you do it, well, you get minus points anyway or don't get bonus points. So a uh, little bit more about automated versus manual attacks. Uh, automated attacks, there is this little bit question of luck. Do you block exactly those kind of attacks that the attackers scripted? Uh, and a little bit foresight. For example, you pretty much, if you have done a lot of cross-site scripting, you might try to block stuff that contains script tags. You can, might con uh, remove or block stuff that contain on-click event or something. On uh, on, uh, on error uh, attributes uh, found inside the packages or su such things like there's stuff that you can try to block but this is question of luck and uh, foresight and monitoring if you see some attacks actually working against you then try to block them or at least try to block them in a way that it blocks most of the traffic uh, bad traffic uh, and manual uh, this is if you are not actually fixing stuff and in most cases you don't have actually that much time to fix stuff you have to react to and fix only there where you discover. This is different in different exercises because in some exercises you have beforehand, like week before exercise, you already have like one, two days access to the system. So you pretty much know what to fix and what, what to look for. In that case, you have more time to fix. But if it's like uh, Cyber Olympics that you're given the access and start fixing, then you probably don't have time to fix everything. So you have to play cat and mouse with the attackers and just monitor, react, and fix stuff that they are attacking and mitigate, uh, for example, with this kind of ways. For example, yeah, with this kind of methods, they still might get some uh, like a PHP code execution with some kind of backdoor at some points, but they can't access the system. They can't run OS commands, uh, such things that they get the access, but 
this is heavily limited. And this brings us to monitoring. This is probably, probably one thing that a lot of teams in different exercises have not thought about that heavily. But this is extremely important. First of all, you will be owned in this kind of exercises. There's just so many vulnerabilities. You can't fix or block them all. Uh, so understanding how you're attacked, uh, what tools or what methods they use, not tools, but mainly methods, and what to go to fix, what to go to block, what, which kind of IPs to block, and so on and so on. You have to understand and see everything that's going on. And for that, it is totally dependent of the system and uh, setup of the exercise because there are different tools for this kind of approach, uh, different uh, um, ways how you can do it, but this depends on the, how the network is set up and what tools are provided by, uh, to you. And the biggest part in a lot of those exercises is differentiating between attacks and normal traffic. Like this, you have to really think sometimes out of the box to block out or filter out normal traffic so you can only see the actual attacks. And this is one of the most difficult stuff in this kind of exercises and actually in real life also. And yeah, again, it's good to think like attacker. For example, as attacker, I would use, uh, to get past web server logs, I would use post parameters for my payloads because they are, by default, they are not logged. So somebody just, in the logs, you see that somebody went to this and this page. Yeah, it was post request, but what are the post parameters? Who knows? So what are, uh, does web server log also uh, headers? For example, if I put backdoor somewhere, I might uh, make the backdoor uh, react to the commands given inside one of the head headers. If this is not locked, nobody will just discover it. And I can reuse all those vulnerabilities as an attacker. So, and also really, really important is uh, preparations, especially if you aim is to have good results. Uh, beforehand, gather as much information as possible. Uh, the, the information that is provided, read it through, understand it, think a little bit what might happen or what might possibly be also there. Script everything that you can beforehand. Uh, if you can and your scripting skills are good enough, scripts of co uh, also like, uh, for example, scripts that uh, change the ini files or configuration files automatically. So you just run, it changes the configuration file, restarts the service. Everything is uh, fixed as you set it. For example, I had, I think, close to 10 scripts, uh, but I had one script that I downloaded into, with VGAT, ran it, it out downloaded every other script, and then I re uh, ran those based on the situation. Like, I didn't know exactly was, what was going to be, so I maybe used only three, four scripts out of the 10, but uh, they uh, saved me quite a lot of time. Uh, predicts possible attacks. Just think what you would hate as an attacker and then do it. Uh, write your own rules uh, or understand how you have to do it because it's really easy to block some of the attacks by just using uh, rules in Snort or Mod Security. Uh, and really be ready to add new rules and remove the existing one during the exercise. But because you might think that I found really cool way, so I, I would block SQL injection by uh, remove, uh, blocking all the requests that contain word and. Well, it's highly likely that you will also block away some legitimate traffic that contain word and. So you have to be consulting ready to remove the, uh, some of the rules that uh, will cost you points because uh, legitimate traffic can't access. And it's uh, similar to real life that you can't put uh, this kind of uh, uh, I, uh, IPSs too heavily, too uh, strong because you might block out legitimate traffic, exactly like real life. Uh, so, yeah, during the exercise, set up everything, monitor as hell, and react to attacks by block blocking them and then restoring the previous situation. So, pretty much fixing something that they uh, messed up. And uh, then fix stuff if there are any time. The fixing of stuff becomes more important when you have uh, manual attacks, because in this case, the attacker knows how to bypass some of the methods, they react to your protection mechanism, and you, if you just block them, they will each time find a little bit different way to get past the blocks. So uh, in case of manual attacks, the fixing stuff is much more important. And that's actually it. And now it's if you have any questions. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, oh, 
Okay. Uh, so my question is basically, where do you obtain uh, this kind of knowledge to participate in this kind of events and to actually be a security guy? For example, if I'm a mathematician, I have some basic uh, programming uh, background, but I really want to know this stuff and I don't feel like just the usual university subjects are fulfilling this request. So where should I look for it? Uh, well, uh for example, in our company, most of, uh, almost actually every one of us has uh, development background, all technical people. Uh, and they know how to write stuff, and based on that, they build it up the skills to break stuff. Where to get those kind of skills is actually you have to do research and learning yourself. There are a lot of good books. Uh, there are, if, if you, your company provides, then you can go to trainings and stuff, but if you, for example, for me, it was just reading a lot and a lot and trying them attacks out, not only reading, but actually trying, trying out. Uh, there's a lot of websites or in the virtual machines that you can practice the attacks, uh, different kind of web attacks or something like this. So pretty much what comes to it is just learning. Uh, there's a lot of information in the internet, there's a lot of information in books. Uh, like uh, for and uh, you have to know that there that means a lot of reading because a couple of books that I most uh, think that are, that are best are all like this thick, so it takes a little bit time, uh, and especially it takes a lot of practice because at some point you start noticing that where the vulnerabilities might be, uh, but this time it comes only with uh, practice and uh, and just doing doing stuff constantly you get better at it. Janos, could, could you make um, afterwards some specific recommendations for beginners with the titles of books or something? Yeah, yeah, of course. Great. I, uh, since I think we put up this uh, uh, slides, I will add a slide with a list of books that I think are quite good. Yeah. You said that uh, you will be owned no matter uh, how much you try. What about real life? Is it the same? Well, in real life, it's actually quite the same. Uh, you, most of your protection mechanisms that you will use uh, protect against uh, common attacks, like uh, automated attacks and uh, such and such. If somebody really, really wants to attack you, and he puts a lot of effort and he's uh, good at it, then he will get in. The examples from NATO, Google, uh, Sony, <laughs> that companies will show that they will get in. And now it's question of, like I said, monitoring. If they use some kind of zero days, that vulnerabilities that are not known yet, you can protect against them in most part. So only thing that you can do is discover the attack afterhand. So you have to know how these kind of attacks are made, and what to look for later in the network, how to monitor this kind of stuff. So yeah. Pretty much, it's a reflection of real life. Just it takes might take a lot more time in real life, or less. Or less. It uh, sometimes it takes a lot less. But uh, regarding that, those exercises, there are like one thousand vulnerabilities per page. Then uh, it doesn't also <laughs> take that long. Any more questions? Any other question? Perhaps uh, Markus, as the main brain behind the Cyber Olympics uh, technical side, would like to add or com comment something. I think it's very important to give um, um, some access to to the labs before the real competition for the students. And um, in next year we will do that. We have an actual lab, a special lab for learning those things before you get hit by bad people. I hope that that was a uh, nice uh, information for everyone. Yeah, that, that is exactly like you can practice uh, through like how the attacks might work, how you might do it, how uh, attackers, how, how you can notice the attacks. It's uh, exactly like I also said that uh, you have to know how to attack. So otherwise it's kind of hard to spot the actual attacks. So, any other questions? If you are a little bit shy at the moment, then Janos is a student, third year student in this building. So, I'm sure that you will have uh, uh, your possibility afterwards also. So, with this, we would like to thank uh, Janos for the nice presentation and information. We wish you all luck in the future and hope to see you participating and giving us advice also organizing the next event. Thank you. Thank you. So.